what's kept me in it is it's truly, it's complex. It requires a range of soft skills as well as some hard skills. I traditionally you think about negotiating and closing being the thing or just making the phone ring and stuff like that. Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello, and welcome to the Revenue Insights podcast. Today, I'm joined by Kirk Facker, VP of Sales at iCore Technologies. He's a go-to-market leader with extensive experience across sales, marketing, and tech in a wide range of different companies. Kirk, it's great to meet you. Pleasure to be here, Lee. Great to meet you as well. So first things first, tell us a little bit more about your story, your background. You know, I touched on it at the beginning. You've got a wealth of different experience at a range of different companies. And I know you do a lot of mentoring with companies as well. So I'd love to get a bit more color to all of that. Sure, sure. So uh, my background going way back um, was an English major. Um, And entering the business world, my my life partner and wife, uh, who did a lot of tech in uh, in her college experience, advised me not to do that for a career. So um, her advice was to find a tech company and uh, go to the back pages of the want ads, find the smallest ad, and just talk your way in. So not from the sales world, uh, to be truthful. Um, so I sort of went from a series of roles at my first company, from operations to operations manager uh, to sales manager, um, and ultimately, they offered me the IT director position, which is weird. Uh, but since then, <clears throat> I've really stayed in sales, um, and I, both in traditional companies as well as a number of startups. Um, and uh, fast forward to now, so I'm at uh, VP of Sales at iCore Technologies, a uh, IT consulting practice. So you mentioned, you know, not necessarily from a sales background, but what has it been that's really kept you in it? What really drives you and has, has brought you all the way through to being VP of sales? Initially, I was very suspicious. I didn't re- regard it as a profession. Um, and it has evolved in fairness to my first impressions of it. But what, what's kept me in it is it's truly, it's complex. It requires a range of soft skills as well as some hard skills. I traditionally think about negotiating, negotiating and closing being the thing or just making the phone ring and stuff like that. But it's everything in between. So it's really a robust, wide uh, profession. And that, that's what I like about it mostly. Always changing too. Oh, absolutely. And that actually comes on really nicely to, to my next question. Obviously, you know, you've got a wealth of experience. What has been the biggest shift, would you say, in in sales, and I'm going to leave that quite broad and open for you. you know, what has been the biggest change, perhaps, in the sales process, or you know, hiring, or whatever that you've seen throughout your career? Yeah, it, there hasn't been just one shift. There's been many. There's been a couple of big ones. The first one, which is sort of pre my career, was moving from traditional product sales to what is called solution sales, and that's kind of still where we are. But that has changed. Um, it, you know, we went, went from selling widgets to trying to place solutions and connect the right solutions with the right customers. That continues to evolve. Um, I think it's technically where we still are. Um, but then fast forward to now, and not only do um, customers and prospects have a deep understanding of your products, your service, your competitors, so the whole value add around educating around products, that has shifted again. Um so more and more, we're, um, salespeople and sales professionals are pulled into becoming ever more creative about, and also just expecting that first conversation with the prospect. They're going to be well educated and probably be talking to four or five other companies at the same time. So navigating through that and making sure that, well, first of all, qualifying the prospect and that, that might be different now. It used to be, you know, anything that comes in, find a way to close it. Um, I think now, Sales are more discerning, and making sure that the fit is 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 good and tight before they even you know take it further into the sales cycle. At least the better salespeople do a lot of qualification up front, just like the prospects do. And so, 
with that, obviously, a lot of that, and I'd appreciate your perspective on this, you know, to do with changes to how people are buying as well, much to your point of going from product-based solutions to solutions-based. So in the sense, you mentioned that it's still evolving. Do you have an idea of perhaps where you think it's heading or, or how it will continue to evolve perhaps over the next couple of years? Yeah, yeah. So I think what is still uh, true, um, I, I haven't read many sales books. In fact, I've only read one. It's called The Challenger Sale. And the best uh, concept in that excellent book, and it's 10 years old now, maybe more, is uh, the idea of teaching, tailoring, and taking control. So the, the teaching part um, is trying to find that intersection. Like, first of all, a salesperson must know a deep they must have a deep understanding of their customers' solutions and really be more expert than the customer in the place that your solution intersects with their need. So that's not going away. I think what's going away is simply the um, the noise uh, is, is drowning out even the most selective, careful, the best salespeople are sort of drowning in a sea of incoming information. And I think what really amplifies that challenge is that um, it's so easy. It used to be that we worried about spam emails, and we still do, of course, but there's there's solutions for that. And people don't pick up their phone, so we're, we have to deal with that. So there's been evolutions where people will use a voicemail as part of like a sequence of actions they take, and the expectation is they're not going to pick up the phone. But then, you know, looking at that, you're still fighting with so much inbound missiles coming at everybody. And I think another thing to keep in mind is that only, first of all, you need to find a, a prospect that's actually interested, not just in what you do, but when you're talking to them. So I think there's a much longer sales cycle now. And even for small business sales, which is what I'm in, you have to sort of build your reputation, build your story. So part of that is actually becoming, um, to the best of our ability, subject matter experts um, in not just sales, but in the, the fields that our customers are in. And that really gets to verticalization. Um, so there are very horizontal products, uh, but even, even in those situations, there are vertical or obviously there's things like the size of the company, which we deal with at iCore a lot. Um, but I think becoming pretty deep in terms of, let, let's say the construction might be, or, or the vertical might be legal. Um, so you're going to want to, know a lot about the legal technology stack as well as what lawyers and the, the people that are the back office people, the IT people, um, the executive director, what, what, what they care about. So I think it's really uh, increasingly the personalization, you, you can't fake it at scale, but I think just to kind of finish off that point, there's so much personalization at scale that is is just not genuine where, you know, People write these scripts and they put you in a sequence and it just comes at you and at you and at you. So finding your way through that, that's the hard thing, even if you're good at your job. And I think it's a really great point to make because certainly from what I've seen, there's a real mixture of different salespeople where you have some that are very much embracing that, you know, becoming the subject matter expert. Um, and that is helping them to cut through the noise. And then I think there is still a, a more traditional approach to it, which is very much a case of, you know, spending as much time as possible on selling and, you know, focusing your time in that area. So what would you perhaps say to sales leaders or AEs that are still very much taking that approach? And I guess the the follow-up to that is, um, how do you actually start to demonstrate the value of becoming a subject matter expert in what in the solutions that you provide? Yeah. Um, there's no magic answer to that. Um, but I think my advice to people that don't undertake that is find a different career because that kind of transactional mindset is going to be, it's already not interesting <laughs> and it's a distraction for those that actually are better. But it's, it's so easy to automate. And we see this already, um, you know, with AI, ML solutions um, that, that are sort of like the power tools of sales now. You know, it used to be the market the marketing stack included inbound marketing, which my wife knows more about than I do because she's a marketing expert. Um, but the idea of sequences, which used to be something, you know, in HubSpot's world, you opt in, you double opt in, you sign up, you in blood, 
And then the sequences go based on a lot of alignment between the person's interests. They sign up for a newsletter and all that stuff. That That's all been kind of ripped <clears throat> over and put installed in the sales <laughs> stack now. So um, uh, the, the point is that you can sort of fake personalization and you can do it not just by picking up the phone repeatedly, um, but by sending out thousands of emails that sort of sound about right. <laughs> um, and that that's going to be more and more. It's happening on LinkedIn. It's happening in all the channels now. So um, my advice is that if you kind of stay there, your job will be gone. You'll be replaced by robots. So um, while there might be a place for that in, in terms of that initial prospecting and qualification, um, using that as your only kind of tool um, it is it's doomed to failure. Um, so I, th- I think what's super helpful is becoming known for something. So in the case of if you, we, t- we picked on lawyers, so you know, pick on, I, my, my main interest is actually around um, life sciences and kind of emerging companies. So instead of immersing yourself in their world, um, that can take the form of, you know, in a very obvious way, um, building at your social profile, um, going on podcasts, for instance, <laughs> um, and then yeah. pinning those things to your LinkedIn page. All, the, all that stuff is, is good, um, but it's really, it's, 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 it's a heavy lift. So um, just, just kind of let that marinate, um, get out there, meet people, be useful, be helpful. In, in my case, I, I do a lot of mentoring. I wouldn't say that's led to a lot of sales necessarily. It's a joy of it for its own sake, but really becoming useful being a, becoming more of a servant than a salesperson, I think, is the future. And then the last point I'll make is listening is so important. I mean, nobody wants to be talked at, so um, it can be very difficult, for, particularly for salespeople, to just be quiet and listen. But people do respond to that. I'm not sure if that answers your question. That's kind of a lot of um, a lot of stuff I just tossed out. So if I need to kind of hone in on the, the point, I can try again. No, no, I, I actually really like the point that you made. And what I'm quite interested to know then, because we were touching a little bit on cutting through the noise before kind of hitting the record button, is, and I say this from my perspective, you know, starting to see more salespeople, you know, being more visible on, on LinkedIn. And I, I think it's, it's okay, I'm posting now consistently. Great. I'm, you know, I'm starting to make progress with this. And then it's, now, how do I actually start to get this to work for me? And I think what I, certainly I'm slowly starting to see more of is salespeople, you know, start to adopt that approach, realize that, oh, if I actually start giving value to people, then that's, you, you're actually not even generating leads per se. You're actually generating referrals because, you know, it's yes. then in a, in a market, in a marketer's words, it's word of mouth marketing then where, you know, someone's looking for, Oh, well, you know, I'm having a problem with this, and it comes up in conversation. Is oh yes, I I know someone. Uh, they've been posting about it on LinkedIn for for like the last month. You should probably go and check them out, and it's generating leads in that way. I guess something I'm interested to ask is naturally, if that's the way of cutting through the noise now, and salespeople start to realise that that is a way of generating value. What happens in you know a year, two years time when? Over fifty percent of A's are starting to use that as as a channel, and then all, all of a sudden it's oh god, now there's even more noise. Um, so what would you be? What would your advice be to really like cut through the noise? You know, in what is inevitably, I think, going to become a far more uh, saturated space. Well, wow, now you're really putting it to me here. Um, I'll get there, um, but I, I want to agree with it. you fully. Um, not, but I would also add, not just going out and kind of blowing your own horn on LinkedIn as an example, um, but also sharing content of people in your network, liking their stuff. I don't mean in an insincere way, just to kind of get more followers or things like that. What I mean is that um, I, I do spend about a half an hour a day on LinkedIn, which could feel like a waste of time to some people, but I kind of go on in the morning and then the afternoon. And I, I look through my feed and it's become a lot more cluttered recently. But just like any social platform is more kind of sponsored content and influencers on there. But I, I try to find people that I used to work with or, or work with now or people I've just met through um, networking or um, lunch club is another great thing to do um, and engage with their stuff. Um, and, you know, that's, um, that's kind and it, it gives them more visibility. Um, but it's also in a very practical way. The more you're out there on the platform, not just preaching, 
but interacting, liking, being supportive, being useful, reposting job openings, that kind of stuff. The algorithm likes that. The people like it. So you get more and more visibility. So that's what people should be doing now. I fully, um, heartily recommend that. Um, Two years from now, dang, you're scaring me. Uh, um, I don't know. That, I, I think a, a lot. I think that the kind of the um, when, once, even though we had this kind of remote, hybrid, or fully remote role now, sales just can be done you know, on, on a video call. Obviously, there's all this monitoring technology, and I don't think our company does it. I hope not. Um, but um, I, I do think that if people are on LinkedIn. It, it can be viewed suspiciously by by management. Um, I would advise management to not sweat that. I mean, focus on the productivity and the results. Um, so I, I do think that's really a good move. Um, now, two years from now, when everyone's doing that, what's the next thing? I don't have a good answer, but I, I will try to think along what we're talking. Okay. we can. If, if it comes to you, we can definitely come back to it. We're kind of on the topic at the minute of talking about, um, I think, the changing ways and, you know, the changing day-to-day of, of salespeople. And uh, I know... Certainly, when I was um, kind of prepping today, um, you talked a lot about you know automation in the past. I think you've, you've um, posted yourself on on LinkedIn about it. So something that I'm curious to know a little bit more about is with more tech being available to salespeople, you know, from you know enablement tools all the way through to things like revenue intelligence. Um, what's your opinion on salespeople using data to help doing what they do? best. Um, and what I'm quite intrigued to know is how can it help them? And also, is there some data which is you would consider just be cluster and actually just adds to the noise? Hmm. Hmm. So we're still at this age when there is it is possible to use automation and respectfully. Um, so I, I will admit to doing this. So I think now, not two years from now, um, rather than have a traditional sales development rep, um, we, we do buy data um, and we are very um, diligent about making sure that it's meeting our criteria of our ideal customer, the buyer personas, um, and we put in relevant messaging and all that stuff. So I think right now that there you can use this kind of thing as a power tool to um, to kind of try to open up territory. Um, it's it's a bit fraught to say that because I don't like it when it happens to me, but there's different ways to do it. It can be done with humor. It can be done with absolute laser focus on what um, the prospect might want. And the, the, the trick is to know when to shut up. You know, if someone unsubscribes, don't bug them anymore. Don't call them. Um, so I think that's there's a place for that still. I think that will be gone in two years, by the way. Um, so um, I think it, it's interesting. I mean, I, our current market is really small business. So it, referrals are absolutely the most important thing. And that comes through clients, that comes through employees. Um, it comes from having um, a, a, a certain position on the internet. Um, so, but I, I don't think of that necessarily with enterprise sales. It, it might be true. I, I have something for me to think about. Is that I mean, in in a very large business, is having that kind of prominence as relevant is to the kind of the small business sales day to day? I don't know. I have to think about that actually. So you start to touch on iCore a little bit more there in terms of like who you're targeting. Um, I know from your LinkedIn, you know, I think you're coming up to five years there in your current role. Um, I'm I'm interested to know if you uh you know knowing what you know now after those near on five years worth of experience, if you could roll back the years back to when you first started knowing what you know now, uh, what would you do differently? Yeah, I, I fully understand our ideal customer now. Um, it's a very specific set of solutions. Um, so I would I would have done more upfront research, <laughs> um, but I, I think. It, Frankly, just in those three, four plus years, things have changed so much since then. Like in this, like when I first joined, it really was kind of um, somewhat transactional sale where you could still land at the right time, somebody ready to buy, and just kind of do your thing. I, I think it's 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 become longer term now. Would that have changed my behavior earlier? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I'm giving a good answer on that one, Lee, frankly. Um, I, I've been with a bunch of different companies and five years is almost a record for me. So um, <laughs> I, I think in each one, you kind of have to learn over because I don't 
tend to come into a role with a lot of depth in the industry. I'm very much a generalist. So I think I would have prepared more about the IT world. Um, beyond that, I think it's just, it's, it thinks the sales has evolved even in those four short years. Mm. And you touched on going from, you know, very much being transactional when you went in. So what would be interesting to know is, you know, in that time, how have you pivoted it away? You know, obviously, having, you know, since day one, evidently, I can sense that you've done a lot of research since and very much changed the way that your teams are selling. So could you elaborate a little bit more on what that looked like and and what you went through to, to get to where you are now? Yeah, well, initially, um, we did a lot of cold calling, not me personally, thank goodness, but um, that was a very important part of the sales process. Um, it's less so now. I think to our, our earlier point, just establish, establishing some kind of brand presence, um, being useful. Um, we are using more technology. The other things that have changed in our industry and, and in many industries are, I mean, initially our customers, our, our brand was um, really concierge, white glove. We will be there at your beck and call. And that, that was limiting us to certain markets. Like we're very strong in Boston and New York and Philadelphia. Um, it's hard to kind of unbundle what happened with the pandemic from how things would have changed anyway. It just accelerated things happening now. So now we have, we used to go in to someone's office and meet with them at a conference table. That's out the window. So um, I think it sort of accelerated the move to the cloud. And at the same time, our customers have moved to the cloud. There, there, no, there really are very few now that have on-premise infrastructure, which was at the time really important to have that kind of, we'll be there in a minute to fix your server approach. And now we can do any of these things, almost all of them fully remotely. So the challenge has been to kind of maintain that brand, which is that white glove concierge service, recognizing that we're now dealing with people that aren't necessarily in their offices much or at all, <laughs> um, they don't have infrastructure to fix. So I think th this may answer your point. We've gone more from uh, an IT company to more of a, an advisory consulting company. And I used the word consulting earlier, and that's always been kind of our brand, but it's more true now. So we've introduced things like a virtual CIO service, a virtual chief information security officer service, uh, we do a lot around um, security in a way. So that, that's not sales changing. That That's the customer's needs changing. And I think we're adapting to that. Back to the edu issue of education, the sales, my sales team has to know a, a lot about a lot of things, but we're super focused now on security, which is on uh, top of mind for almost any business and any business leader. Again, just becoming more expert in that we can add value. And I think... And, and that's a really important point, right? Oh, oh, and it is that point around actually, you know, what value does your does your product provide? Um, what was the uh, what was the penny drop moment when you kind of when you know we need to actually shift from transactional selling to oh, if we actually just tell them, you know, how we're going to make their lives better, you know, how to make their day to day easier. That's actually what people are engaging with now. Yeah, and I don't want to diminish the transactional nature of some types of sales is still a thing. Um, it was simpler. We had a very unique solution even before I joined. Um, so that was differentiated. Um, but the actual process of getting out there and meeting people and engaging was more um, scale, you know, basically doing a lot of calls, a lot of emails, a lot of LinkedIn stuff, um, and just kind of just trying to soften up the, the ground. Uh, I think what's if, if there was a penny drop moment, it was just noticing um, how much each of us is assailed by that kind of stuff. Um, so it wasn't an aha moment. It's like an OMG moment that this is just, it's getting ridiculous and we have to find a better way of engaging with prospects than, than just behaving um, in the same way that we are behaved towards by um, the less um, respectfully minded prospectors. You mentioned earlier in our conversation uh, that you do a lot of mentoring. So um, I'm interested to know, is there perhaps one particular issue that comes up frequently um, in in your mentoring sessions? And if so, um, how, how are you recommending to solve it? So having made a lot of mistakes in my life at a lot of startups, um, I come from that perspective. But I would say today's entrepreneurs have um, some of the benefits that 
earlier ones like me didn't have. But then again, back to the problem of just noise. Um, the advice I always give, which is you know, not brilliant, is that spend a lot of time up front validating your idea. Um, it can be very tempting to assume because it's cool that other people, other companies want it, need it. Um, there's a lot of ideas that sound great, uh, but you have to test the business model. So a lot of what I do early on is help them validate, not just that their thing can work and that it's cool, but identifying the market and then doing a lot of research into the, into the idea with p- prospective customers. It's not rocket science, um, but it's something I haven't done. <laughs> um, I met my first few ventures. I just, this is cool. Um, and therefore we're going to be able to sell it. So the strategy I think is really important. And the, the entrepreneurs tend to come with really deep expertise in one subject matter area. A lot of them are engineers, right? Um, I deal with a lot of people at MIT. Um, but then they're not, um, and it's, this is just a matter of time in. They're not um, used to people necessarily, or or they're a bit shy about reaching out and trying to test their ideas. And I think that's um, it's so important. So ma- making those first hundred calls or emails, whatever it is, talk to well, maybe more like a thousand emails and calls to talk to at least a hundred people about your idea. Um, and that's that part of it. You can just put that in the, on, the, on the blackboard. But then you have to do it. So the other thing I think is helpful that I do and my other colleagues do in these, in these programs is keep people accountable for each meeting that they, they, they come with homework, right? So our, our job is to see how they're, how they did and then help them plan the next two weeks until we meet again. I'm interested to know, is that the type of, do, do, do you implement that kind of framework into your teams that I call as well in terms of like the framework around those meetings and having the, the homework, as, uh, as we can call it. Um, I'm fortunate to have more senior salespeople usually who have been around. And we, we, I think back to the who you choose to be on your team is, is super important. Um, people that are incapable of listening, they don't get hired at ICOR or anywhere else that I'm working that I have influence over it. Um, so the people coming in already have um, a listening mindset. Um, they're already um, solution minded, or else again, that, that's all the hiring process. So it, it's not the same problem. And they're all, most of them are outgoing, or else they wouldn't have chosen sales for a career. So it's a different thing. Um, I think the part that's the same is having a clear plan. Um, it's very easy to get distracted by, um, you know, your phone, you know, and any, any one of a number of things can offer distractions. So having a clear plan, what you're going to do this week and kind of plan out the week ahead. That's something that may be a bit like the advice we give entrepreneurs to really make a plan, follow it, learn from it, and then make a new plan for the next week. Something that now, obviously, on this podcast, we've had a lot of revenue operations leaders as well as like sales and CROs in the past. So I guess first question is, um, are you running uh, with a revenue operations team over at iCorp? Uh, and if so, what, what does that relationship look like? I wish we had that. I've, I've learned more about that uh, very important role and function um, in the past year or so. It's, it's sort of it's coming along. I mean, at least larger companies perhaps have had it longer. I think we're a bit too small to have an individual in that role, but I think the spirit of it can be there. The the interface between sales and marketing. I mean, I'm forced to be married to a marketing leader. So that's already a thing with me or else I wouldn't be married still probably. Um, but then yeah, our, our business is like my, my team is strictly new business. So the other part of what RevOps would support, as I understand it, would be not just sales and marketing, but um, customer success. So at i those are all three, not silos, but they're, three separate functions without an obvious integration point. Uh, and I can see the value of that and how we're handling that is more as the, as the management team, as the executive team. We meet once a month and we we meet weekly actually, but we meet once a month specifically to talk about what's working, what's not between the different functions that all generate or pr- produce uh, revenue for the company. Amazing. Kirk, I want to move on to a final question. Um, and and I feel like I might know the answer to this because you kind of name dropped it earlier. Um, if you could recommend one book to other sales leaders, what would it be? 
I'm afraid I've already recommended it, but I, I it, it holds up. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in it. Um, but that said, I think the advice I would give is to read lots of books. <laughs> so what, what I, and this may not be a direct answer, but I, I think you have to, in every role, not just sales, not particularly even sales, you have to learn continuously. So find what interests you, um, mix it up. Um, but just be intentional about reading, whether it's physical books that are, I put them in my ear with audible, you know, how, whatever you do, consume information all the time, keep up with it. Um, listen to podcasts, um, listen to this one, for instance, but listen to all of them. I, I think that's really, be a, be a continuous learner. I think that's my only way of saying and that that's how I found the challenger sale 10 years ago by a recommendation, but just keep reading. Absolutely. Amazing. I think that might be the best answer I've had yet to that question. So thank you. Cool. Um, sure. Kirk, it's been wonderful to have you on. Um, for, for anyone listening, I know you're, you're really um, active on socials. Uh, where can they connect with you and where can they learn a little bit more about what you're doing over at Icon? Cool. Okay, sure. So a couple of places. Um, Kirk Facker, I'm uh, the only, only Facker on LinkedIn probably, luckily for me. Um, I have a website, facker.com, uh, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a discerning networker. Like if people prospect me on LinkedIn, I will shut them down. <laughs> but if they truly want to connect and have even one conversation, um, do that. Um, as far as ICOR Technologies, what we do there, it's I-C-O-R-P-S uh, dot com. Uh, if, if you want to know more about that. We will put that down in the show notes, but I really appreciate you spelling it out. So thank you. Kirk, it's been fantastic to have you on. Thank you so much. Um, and, and to everyone listening, thank you. Uh, and we'll catch you next week. Thanks so much, Lee. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.